Thank you, uh, Professor Hefner, for indeed uh, well, a very comprehensive talk which covers a lot of key aspects related to politics, state, civil society, and of course, Islam and religion. If you can recall, uh, Prof. Hefner started his talk with mentioning his own personal experience meeting our previous Prime Minister, uh, Abdullah Badawi, or of course we all know him as to be Pa'Allah, and which later towards the end of his talk, he talks a lot more about uh, civil Islam. I'm sure you could still recall, especially most of us who are not too young, I guess, we could still recall that the brand which Pa'Allah used when it comes to explaining about Islam was Islam Hadari, which I think in a way it reflects some kind of idea of civil Islam. At that time, I would suppose that not many people are quite really appreciating or quite really uh, taking the, 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 Islaming, the Islam Hadari brand quite seriously at that time. But if we go back to those years, maybe in the early, in the mid 2000s, there are some kind of progression when it comes to democratic situation and, 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 and the civility of the nation. That could be argued maybe, especially if we to com compare to our current time now. I don't know, I'm not putting a statement there, but maybe we can explore those a bit historically, not too detailed, not too much, in our later discussion, in our later sessions. Uh, I would just like to take this opportunity because I didn't have the time to uh, introduce or in fact uh, mention out about uh, the background of Professor Rob, uh, Bob Hefner. Uh, professor Hefner is a professor of anthropology and director of the Institute of Culture, Religion and World Affairs at Boston University. He served as associate director from 1986 to 2009. He has directed the program on Islam and society since 1991, coordinated interdisciplinary educational programs on religion and world affairs and is currently involved in research projects comparing responses to modern social change, modernity in Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Um, the whole, when it comes to his background, which is actually quite long, I'm sure you can look into our program book to get into more details, but one, uh, one of his works with his, which is most uh, important as well is his book on the civil Islam, which uh, is our key reference when it comes to um, planning this conference itself. Okay, so now I would like to open uh, the floor for questions. Indeed, there's a lot of key topics. I assume there may be some complicated ideas as well, which was uh, being uh, mentioned by uh, Prof Hefner. You may need some clarification. We may want to contest some of the ideas being uh, shared by Prof Hefner. Anyone with questions? I see like our friend in the front here, brother. My God, looks like he's already <laughs> thinking of some questions. Pe please feel free to go to the mic. I think we could start with Prof uh, Said Farid first. He already raised his hand first. My God. Thank you. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Bob, for the uh, very interesting talk. Um, just a couple of, uh, um, uh, one or two comments and m maybe one question. Um, but, but uh, with, with reference to um, what you were saying about uh, Pa'ala and his idea about Islam Hadari, civilizational Islam, um, it's interesting that you know in the organization of this event, I think maybe it's the first one on civil Islam. Am I am I right, uh, Dr. Faro? Um, we are. And I don't, I don't mean this in a critical way. I think it's sort of, uh, it's, it's a good development. But we're going back full circle to the earlier discussions in the 90s about civil society and about masyarakat madani, which is almost not talked about at all nowadays. But I think we may be going back uh, to that. Um, and Islam Hadari or civilizational <coughs> Islam uh, is also part of that uh, discussion. Although it might, I think, in, in the days of Pa'la, it was seen as, uh, uh, you know, as a um, an idea that, um, uh, you know, sort of competing with Anwar Ibrahim's idea of masyarakat uh, madani. Um, so that, that's just a, a comment. But I think we probably, as we 
uh, as we develop the discourse on civil Islam, we, we would probably have to go back to those earlier discussions um, as well. Um, I have a question. Um, you mentioned Jonathan Fox. Uh, um, a study and, and he said that there's never been a complete separation between religion and state anywhere in the world except in the US. Yeah, and I was quite struck by that because I, I would have thought that um, there was more collaboration um, um, between religion and state in the US than in many European uh, states, um, partly because of the role of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the, the, the Christian right and so on and so forth. So maybe you could comment uh, on that. Um, and then um, my last uh, comment or question. This issue about the compatibility of religion and democracy. I think if we look at different Muslim countries, we will see that the question uh, has to be answered in a, in a different way. Um, now, I can, I can uh, say that in the case of Malaysia, and I think it would also apply to some other countries like some of the Gulf states, that it's not really a question of compatibility between Islam and democracy, but it's more a question of what kind of Islam we're talking about. So in Malaysia, the distinctive stamp of Islam is its feudalistic character. Um, the kind of Islam that is propagated, that is promoted, is, is promoted by an elite uh, which is infused with feudal values. And in that sense, it is very different from Indonesia. Although we are both part of the Malay world, but actually, as far as uh, um, state religion is, uh, is concerned, they are entirely different. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that the, the, the feudal elite were supported and promoted um, in colonial times. Um, and the feudal values um, have uh, continued into the post-colonial state. So, you know, feudal values like um, attention to hierarchy, um, uh, what else? Uh, uh, the arbitrary nature of uh, rule, the lack of concern with social justice, um, and also uh, a kind of uh, infusion of irrationality. Um, and many other features. You find this everywhere, but this is promoted by the state. And our ulama are also very feudalistic in their, uh, in their approach and in their attitude even. So it seems to me that in the case of Malaysia, and I think that you could say the same thing of Saudi Arabia, of some of the Gulf states, this feudalistic uh, orientation is very strong um, in, uh, as far as state religion is concerned. And it is spreading in civil society, in society. So to what is the extent to which that can, you know, um, um, interfere with attempts to develop uh, a civil Islam? This, uh, this is uh, something that, you know, may be interesting for you to think of in your comparison with, uh, when you reflect on, uh, on, you know, the differences between Indonesia and, and Malaysia. Uh, thank you very much, Pa'at uh, Alatas. Um, uh, I, I fully agree with your observation about the relevance, uh, your observation that we are in many ways revisiting ideas from the 1990s. Uh, the ideas that I focused on today had more to do with the revival of a debate in certain Western circles. Uh, and then using that, of course, I tried to today to, to open up something that was new. But yes, the ideas are back. But you've correctly, and I think quite wisely reminded us that, yes, I think uh, Islam Hadari, civilizational Islam, uh, I was at the 2004 Khilaf conference, as I said, and I have to say, uh, whereas some of my colleagues in the United States, including, I would say, some Southeast Asians, and I won't identify them, uh, thought it was something of an empty suit, if one can use that I think rather strikingly American expression. That is just a, somebody who's wearing a fancy suit and then has no substance. I, I didn't have that impression. First of all, I thought Pa'ala was, and I had that conversation with him for an hour and a half. I just thought he was breathtakingly smart. 
And he was also uh, acutely aware of the nature of the society in which he worked, uh, in which he lived, in which he was raised, and the fact that one had to uh, work in a way that was not just reflective of one's own personal intelligence, life history, or whatever. I won't say more. Uh, but I was also at, the, at the, a number of the panels in 2004. The Malaysians, the Ma Malaysian Muslim intellectuals whom I listened to, and these, their papers were never published as a collection, were not empty suits at all. This was a very rich and I think uh, quite relevant intervention and contribution on the part of um, uh, Muslim <coughs> Malaysian intellectuals. And I actually think uh, that whereas uh, Anwar Ibrahim's concept of Masharakat Madani, I understand it, uh, I, it, and I have sympathy sort of for its formulation, I actually was never quite sure what it meant. And, uh, and that was, I'm not making any judgment or intervention, I'm not a political person. Uh, but I just didn't see it. And I, I, in Indonesia, interestingly, the, there was a book published on Masyarakat Madani, Dalam Bahasa Indonesia, Masyarakat Madani Melawan Masyarakat Civil, civil Melawan Civil Society, uh, Ahmad Basso's book. And I thought th this was a very sophisticated exposition of what was in question with these two different concepts. And I learned more from that. But at any rate, I think this is appropriate. Uh, I think it's very appropriate to revisit these ideas of the 90s. I think we are back to recognizing culture matters again. We are back to wondering to what degree this concept of civilization, which some people, of course, re reject. Many of my colleagues say that's, this, that's Huntington. I actually think if one grounds it, not just in some abstract collectivity, the West, the Muslim world, but as you suggested, and I think very wisely, grounded in specificities that vary somewhat from society to society, it's not just a useful concept, it's deeply vital and necessary. Islamic identity has both uniquely local and then powerfully translocal qualities, characteristics to that, uh, to, to it. And the nature, as I tried to suggest tonight, the nature of the debates unfolding in societies that are otherwise characterized, as you pointed out, uh, by very different social structures, the nature of some of the debates, such as to how we are to define Islamic ethics, who and through what methodology does one do so? Are the maqasid al-sharia really a kind of appropriate methodology or as as Ghazali thought, is that an invitation to a certain kind of license in the formulation of a proper Islamic ethics? So all these things actually come up across countries, across contexts. They're just part of the debate, but I, I fully agree with you. Uh, very important, and I think, I, I don't think this is just a kind of rehash and revisitation. I think on the contrary, as you're implying, it's actually, we, we stand in a better position, ironically, to really evaluate and implement what is good in these concepts by comparison when we were really fighting Huntington or whatever we were doing. W that was a level of debate and conceptualization that was not helpful and where we had to sort of clear the debris away before we could get to anything of substance. We can move to the issues of substance. There are very substantive ethical and political issues in question here. Your observation about Jonathan Fox is absolutely apt. The paradox of the separation of the, le it's a legal constitutional separation of religion and state, which is a relative, not an absolute high wall, but it's, legally speaking, it's a surprisingly high wall. Um, it has, as, John, as Jose Casanova, my colleague and friend, sociologist of European and American religion, points out repeatedly, it was precisely because of this high wall of separation, as well as the religiosity of the American people in general, that this kind of open field situation created by the fact that the state could not endorse any single religious tradition, it created a field in which religion, religious competition proliferated. So American society has always been a deeply religious society. It's always a society as well that whose religiosity has been characterized by the French political theorists 
Chantal Mouffe, what she calls, I think entirely aptly, agonistic plurality, a competitive plurality, fiercely competitive plurality. And ironically, if we can go back to Jose Casanova, it's precisely this competitiveness of religion in American civil society that first of all guarantees the religious values and religious organizations periodically catapult into the public sphere and if you will so issues, religious issues, much more than is the case in Western Europe become central issues of debate, homosexuality, abortion rights, much more intensely and fiercely debated on religious grounds in the United States. But technically we can say, well, that's within civil society. But exactly as you're saying, and here's where Fox has to be, the comment that I drew from Fox has to immediately been qualified, the kind of religious coloring of civil society periodically leads to efforts to not merely, if you will, color civil society and policy and legislation, but actually to breach, lower, or explode that high wall. And that is not that has happened repeatedly. We can, it, I, I won't go into the details here, but for those of you who have not had the opportunity to read my colleague and friends, Ahmed Kuru, a great Turkish political scientist sociologist, his study of secularism in Turkey, France, and the United States, he shows that one of the areas where this puncturing of the high wall, the breaching of the wall, in an effort, if you will, to bring it down, occurs most frequently in the United States for the past 150 years has been in education, where again and again and again, uh, state officials have not merely said, oh, well, we want the state to support religiosity, that's good, we think a pious people is good people, but actually, particularly in the 19th century, the lesson be at, at, at that time, the major minorities were Catholics and Jews. Catholics and Jews had to take courses in which they were given instruction in Protestant biblical theology today, in, in the night, beginning in the 1950s and the 1960s, that same sort of culture has periodically been attempted, but typically been pushed back uh, on the part or as a kind of religious socialization for Muslims. I think we've made progress, but you're absolutely right. Foxes, without this qualification that the high wall is periodically dismantled or its, its dismantling is attempted, is as equally characteristic, ironically, of the United States, ironically, precisely as a result of the vibrance of religiosity and civil society, which itself is vibrant in part because you have this competitive religious sphere constantly generating new ways of being Christian and Jewish, or today, Muslim. Uh, Muslim diversity in the United States is a sight to behold. And I, I celebrate it. I'm not fantasizing or I romanticizing it. The American Muslim community is a remarkable Muslim community. It's diverse, but it dialogues with the, each other. It has this wonderful African American, a quarter of all Muslims in the United States are African Americans. And the legacy of African Americans has also colored the practice of Islam because Muslims come in from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, and they realize, oh, these African descended people, they've struggled, they've suffered. And they have to list, they have to be accommodated and respected as fully equal at any rate. So that's just to agree with you. Um, the compatibility issue has to be associated not just with questions, big civilizational questions of Islam and democracy, but country specific, social structural specific peculiarities. Kuwait is different from Morocco. Uh, Morocco is different from Indonesia. Malaysia and Indonesia are different. I'm, I'm not going to venture uh, any kind of commentary on Malaysia because I'm not an expert. And every time I, and, and I have to say, I have a somewhat romantic understanding of Malaysia. And I will even buttress that with a sociological assertion that may, people may want to take exception to. But I think Malaysia has a very promising future. I think it has a very promising future. The commitment to education uh, means that the plurality issues that, yes, I know, this is a plural society. Plurality in the United States, everywhere, is a challenge. But I think over the long run, the combination of this remarkable educational establishment, an Islamic community that is working things through, uh, is a recipe for 
for optimism. But your general point, uh, which is the real one, because I'm not commenting on Malaysia, uh, your general point is absolutely correct. And tomorrow I'll try to make a few comments about the specificities of Indonesia and why Indonesia, even though it's unique, it nonetheless does offer some really fascinating generalizable lessons on civil Islam. It's about this, uh, the, the Muslims in Europe, you know. Uh, a few years back, I, I noticed that the Muslims uh, at that time, I think they were immigrants, you know. They were accepted with open arms, even though they come from other parts of the world, different culture, different race, different religion. And I believe that time, the Europeans were willing to accept them because they had this thinking that, well, you can always have unity through diversity. But recent events have made them think, you know, that they have not been able to, what, what shall I say, be part of that European uh, population because they tend to, seg what they call, separate themselves, live among themselves. So they tend to be, what shall I say, they need to have some form of integration. And that is where I think Germany has got that problem right now. Uh, even with the election, recent election, I think the loss in seats for the current Angela Merkel party is a sign of that, you know. Now, I just like to see in the near future, would this problem of uh, Islam in Europe versus the, the European civilization, is it going to be uh, exploding in the near future? Is there any means that this thing can be cooled down and some sensible uh, thing can be done about this? Not for now. I think I got one question. Um, uh, Prof, you mentioned about the, one of the key aspects of um, moving towards a civil Islam is the path dependencies, which also depends on a Muslim civil society. And part of it, of course, involved the uh, involvement of Muslim in societies and in politics. I would like to relate this to uh, the situation of the advancement of Muslim Democrats, particularly in political parties in several countries. Uh, the case in Malaysia, it seems like maybe quite interesting, as Dr. Farouk did mention before, there was a rise in Muslim democracy between 2008 until 2013. But when the Islamic party then separated one party clearly moved towards the uh, the Muslim Democrat path while the other remains very quite politically Islamist, more Islamist as conservative, I would put it that way. And if you refer to other countries, do you see that there is a rise of wave of Muslim democracy uh, when it comes to popularity and when it comes to e effectiveness in governance? Some would say the AKP model would be like one good model of uh, Muslim democracy advancing but do you see other examples and could, would that be the future of muslim societies when it comes to uh, democratic and political development well thank you those are uh, both very uh, very complex but great questions i'll start with europe uh and i will try to keep myself brief because uh it's such a it is a very complicated story. It's also somewhat distressing. Uh, the short answer to your question would be, uh, I think Europe is in the early approaching middle phases of a very serious citizenship crisis. That the rise of the populist right um, is exacerbating the sense among some Muslims that they're not welcome. And I've done hundreds of interviews in Europe, hundreds, with uh, Muslim imams, ordinary people, students, as well as you know sophisticated intellectuals. And um, I've also worked in and lived in Europe since I was 20 years old. So I ha I've watched Europe, particularly France, and I will say the changes are palpable. 
And so you have on one hand the rise of a very specifically, the, it's not anti-immigrant. Europe is not anti-immigrant, there's a little. It's anti-Muslim. It, it, I'm s very sorry to say that. I don't like throwing stones. I'm a, I'm a person who wants to be positive. It's anti-Muslim. Uh, there, yes, there's, any, if you go to the UK, the UK's a particularly hard spot right now, and yes, they don't like Poles, and that's rather astonishing. But in any case, that is nothing compared to what's the general pattern across Europe. So you have that. You have, secondly, uh, you have Daesh, and more significantly, uh, you have Salafism in its general sense is, of course, we all know a wide variety. I have many Salafi friends in Indonesia, and I had Salafi, sort of ordinary Salafi activists in France who were very comfortable with me. They knew I studied and had great sympathy for Islam and Muslims. So I, th this, I emphasize it's a spectrum. But in addition to ISIS, there is a segregationist spectrum that has responded to and grown as a result of what they see as a perceived rejection of Muslims. So their response is that, OK, if you're going to reject us, we're going to reject you. And I don't want to reduce Salafism to that. Salafism is a much more specifically normative debate. And I actually have considerable respect for it in its intellectual varieties. I think this is a very interesting and very important process. I'm a, someone who every time I read commentaries on fiqh, I am just astonished by the sophistication of the classical fiqh thinkers. The, this is a great civilizational legacy. It's a very pluralistic and agonistic civilization. But the variety of Salafism that I'm speaking of here, the segregationist Salafism, the Salafism that says no friends, no friends if they are not Muslims. And you know, 80% of these people who call themselves Muslim around you, they are not Muslims. And I, I am not a exaggerating. 80 to 90% is the figure that one hears. It is a fierce segregationist urge, that's not the main problem. If you didn't have this shift in the kind of nature of European citizenship, and I have called it a crisis of liberal citizenship, and that is not, I don't think, hyperbole at all. If you didn't have that, I think the process of integration, which was underway, you're absolutely right. And it was in some countries working better than others. Ironically, people always think, oh, France was worse. The Netherlands was good. No, no. <laughs> the, the Netherlands, they never really allow anybody in. <laughs> the French, on the other hand, if, if you have a certain measure of sophistication, even no matter where you're from, if you can spin it intellectually. <laughs> so, but, but politics is not, and culture, public culture is what we're talking here. It's no, be, no longer being mediated by these kinds of interesting grassroots complex process. It's being packaged and commodified and sold in a very cheap form by these populist politicians. And obviously, as you can hear, and I, I'm an independent. I'm not a party person. I don't like to get involved in this kind of politics. But it's the same thing with Mr. Trump in the United States. Does he know anything about Islam? Uh, <coughs> no, he knows nothing. And except that he had golf courses, I think, in, in the Gulf. And he always had a history of getting along with his business partners there. But because he saw a political opportunity, he packaged, commodified, and sold this cheap argument that somehow appealed to a people who were feeling precarious, insecure. And there is that sensibility, both for economic but also cultural reasons. The negotiation, the creation of a new kind of Plural culture is very difficult everywhere, but it's very serious. So yes, to the short answer, the concluding answer, I, I love Europe. I love France. France is what made me go into academia. I love France. There is a crisis of unprecedented proportions to pluralism in Western Europe right now. 
on the question of what will, where is civil Islam emerging, I think what's interesting, particularly if I can just focus on the Arab Spring, all the poll data was there and it's been confirmed again even in the aftermath of this tragic, the tragic repression of the Arab Spring in Syria and I would say in Egypt. In its aftermath, the Muslim public continues to subscribe in high numbers to this dream of imbricating democratic constitutionalism with Islamic values. That dream needs work. Pa Zainal and I have a project we talk about and look for examples of normative work. You just can't say we want the two. So the ideal is alive and well, but it's still a work in process. But where we see its efflorescence taking shape most powerfully is yes in a few countries, and yes in, I don't want to call them social movements. I want to call them sort of cultural processes taking place among Muslims, often among people who don't want to get involved in politics. That's a very familiar, I come from a country where <laughs> In the old days, most people didn't like politics, and they sort of wanted to have private lives. Americans were, I think, rightly criticized for being too privatistic. But in any case, this, the politicization process has, uh, the, I'm sorry, the culturalization of a culture of civil Islam, I encounter it everywhere. I encountered it in Egypt. It's struggling now institutionally. It's alive and well in Turkey, but political, pro it's powerful in Turkey, powerful in Turkey, but there are other countervailing forces. There are also international tensions. There's this perceived rejection on the part of Western Europe, and I think that perception is largely correct. Uh, but there's also, obviously, there are some uh, community-specific and system-specific events taking place, not least of all in the aftermath of the coup, which was an awful thing. It was an awful and undemocratic thing. But the combination of these things means the, the institutional realization of civil Islam. I, I long thought of Turkey as an area where it was strongest. I still think it is strong. But for the moment, the political process at the, at the AKP level, and I traveled twice to Turkey as a guest of the AKP. Uh, I have many AK friends and I visited AK schools and people in the, in the Diamat and the Ministry of Religion. It, it, they were wonderful. But in the aftermath of a coup, in the aftermath of uh, this very sad sectarian war that is on there all around them, and also one would say uh, with the Kurdish issue, one wishes it could just sort of be resolved, but it hasn't been. There is a great sense of precariousness among everybody in Turkey, across the spectrum. And this is not an environment in which this, I think, still very widespread sense of civil Islam as a kind of cultural reality and presence, a public ethics in search of social institutions. It remains strong, but the institutions, the realization of the institutions is going to be hard. So, where I, where is it, it's going to flourish in the United States, not because of the genius of our politicians, but, because, but despite them. Uh, it's alive and well in the United States. It's alive and well in certain circles, in very strong circles in the UK and in Western Europe. It's alive and well, I won't, I'm not saying that campur tangan, but I believe it's alive and well in Malaysia. I am very optimistic about the future of Malaysia. I know you, brothers and sisters know more than I. You have your religion, I have mine. You have your country, I have mine. And I defer to your judgment. But I, I, I think it's alive and well. And the main reason I think it's, it will continue to flourish, even where it, as in the Arab majority countries, does not find institutional realization, is because it is a political and public ethical formula for defending Islam. It's not primarily a political project. And I think many people, not least with Daesh, but with others, less dramatic examples, but they, let's take Daesh. They look at Daesh and they say, Islam, that dong. 
you think, but, and it is s small and large examples like that that inspires this very, very interesting process of cultural reflection and public ethical creation. So it may remain more of a public ethic than a kind of full-blown institutional reality. But the Muslim world is going through a hard spot. It will survive. It's, I, people always say, Hefner, what have you been drinking? I say this to my policy-making friends in, in, in Washington, D.C. I say, yes, it's a hard time. The Muslim world is a great world, and it is going to, the, its greatness is going to prevail, not these Daesh folks. Thank you, uh, Professor Hefner. I would like to call for a, a, uh, for, for a round of applause for a very interesting talk, a very interesting start, and most importantly for bringing up a sense of a breath of optimism, uh, not just for our conference and our discussion over the next uh, two days at least, but also when it comes to giving us uh, a new imagination on how should we deal with or how should we understand the situation related to Islam and, and Muslim society. Thank you, Prof, for tonight. And uh, before I end the session, I would like to ask uh, for tomorrow, we are going to have quite a packed uh, schedule in the morning session. In the afternoon, we're going to have group discussions and later with uh, another talk series. I hope everyone could be punctual with the time. Um, and everyone make sure to not be missing any of the sessions and most importantly, please take part lively in the discussion as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Professor Hefner and very good night.